this this way. Ooh, Ooh, make it again. Again. Arf. Islands of heaven. Jesus loves you and is there for you. Welcome in to the David L. Gray Show, off code and unscripted. And we're I talk about things without a filter and without a teleprompter, and we are live. I got one thing for you guys tonight. A very interesting show. I think we understand mass nightmares. We've been doing mass nightmares for over man, over a year. Um, been doing a lot of them, maybe over 22 of them is about 22 mass nightmares. If you count the mass and medleys, when we, we do many of them in one time, we're probably approaching 30 different mass nightmares. So I think we understand mass nightmares. So, and in fact, we even have an anatomy of a mass nightmare here to four, you know, we saw these bad liturgies and we thought, oh, these things are crazy. But I think what we found out by doing mass nightmares, so many of them for the past year and a half, is that they're all kind of alike. Is They have, in fact, like their own type of liturgy themselves. <laughs> that they all do the same types of things. So... It's a whole genre of a type of a liturgy. It's a whole new liturgy in itself. In fact, not only do they, they do the same types of things during the liturgies, like they typically have the children's liturgy. They tend to have no quiet time. They tend to, the priest tends to say during the concert, prayers of consecration, he tends to say for all, rather for many. In, in addition to many of the things that they do alike during the liturgy, we also found about the mass nightmares that they do, these churches do a lot of the same things outside of the mass. They, this is the profile. They tend to have some sort of gay ministry. They tend to be in a place that's politically liberal. They tend to have a bishop that's a homophile. So they have a lot of things alike. So we understand mass nightmares. So tonight what we're going to do is something a little bit different. The question is out there, has been out there. What does a, a reverent Norvis Ordo mass look like? What, what does it look like? If it's not this, if it's not the mass nightmare, which, or these theme liturgies or the type of liturgy that most Catholics are exposed to every Sunday, what, what does a reverent Norvis Ordo look like? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to put it together and we're going to show, we're going to give some sort of structure by which we can start asking our priests and our bishops, this is what we deserve. This is what we need. If the Norvis order is always going to be with us, if the answer isn't always to go to the Anglicans ordinate mass or the traditional Latin mass or go east to the Byzantine, Melkite, Ruthenian, whatever. If the Norvis order is always going to be with us, then give us Jesus, give us something that's reverent. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Hey, make sure you guys that are coming in, appreciate you coming in. Make sure you hit that like button. If you aren't getting notifications, hit the sub button, hit the notification bell as well. Appreciate that. Hey, make sure you guys hop over to the Gray Reports, where that always has the latest news about what's going on in the world. What's been going on lately? What's been a big story Lately, over um, on the Gray Report this week was um, apparently everything that's going on with Donald Trump and um, that search warrant. That's been a big story um, this week. So, and and that's quite fascinating. I didn't do a video about it yet because I'm still waiting for more information to come out to see what's see what's really going on. So, but that's that's the big thing. But a lot more Catholic news, a lot going on in the Catholic Church right now. Um, so, yeah, make sure you guys hop over to the Gray Report. That's David L. Gray.info for the, the latest. And I appreciate everyone who is subbing and liking and becoming patrons and joining. Appreciate all that. So let's get into this. I'm not going to have a, la a long preface before we get into the video. So we're at we're at five minutes now. Okay. So I do want to preface this, this mass nightmare with just taking a look at what, what can we say? 
Okay, what, what can we say? I'll say it like that. So like I said, we the Novus, the Novus Ordo, Ordo liturgy is always going to be with us. Um, we have two things that we need to do. One, we need to fight for access to the older liturgies, whether that's the Roman rites, whether it's the the Eastern rites, maybe it's the Dominicans, Missa Cantata or the Dominican Mass. We deserve the liturgies of the church. So we always have to fight for access. We should demand that because the, the church has, has always had a plurality of liturgies. And as the faithful, what we're called to is we're called to holiness. That's our call. We're called to holiness. And for some people, some liturgies just promote their, their calling more than others. Every liturgy isn't for everybody. That's that's just the facts. It may be preferences, it may be culture, it may be what, whatever. Whatever liturgy promotes your holiness is the liturgy you should be able to have access to because Jesus Christ has called you to that. So that's one thing. But the second thing is that we have to ask for reverence of the Norvis Ordo. We just can't, if it's always going to be with us, we just can't um, allow it to become what I think is the trajectory of all Norvis Ordo's, Ordo Masses, and that is for it to be a nightmare. Okay, so th those are the two things. Now, within that second body of fighting for reverence in a Norvis Ordo, well, what is that? Well, what is reverence? And that's something that I really struggle with, um, ladies and gentlemen, for a long time. Like, what is a reverent Norvis Ordo? And and I, I think it's we can't just say, well, we we have to add this and that to it. We, to do this and that, um, because I think it's it's more than that. Because the the, the driving issue with the Norvis Ordo liturgy is, is not that it's not in Latin. It's not that it's in not the verses populum, the, the priest facing the people that is in. Um, you know th those things those things are deficient in a lot of ways. But the biggest problem with the Norvis Ordo liturgy is that it's, it's kind of like the liturgies of the first three centuries of the church. And there's a reason why the, the church improved liturgy. <laughs> so in the first three centuries of the church, the Catholic church, the liturgy was quite abbreviated. The priest didn't pray much for the people at all. Um, there was even a kiss of peace, you know, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't really great liturgy. A lot of us, if we went back to the first three centuries of the church, you know, sure, it won't be any clowns. It won't be a guy blowing balloons or anything like that. It won't be a guitar, but you know, it was not really, it wasn't really that beautiful. It wasn't really that, that great in a sense. But I think what the church found out over the, the course of the next thousand years and beyond up until Vatican II was that as sin increased in the world, as sin increased in the world, it was necessary for prayers of the priests to increase during the Mass, where everyone was at. And so, and this is why you see in the development of liturgy that the priest who is in persona Christi, who is our mediator, who is our intercessor, received in the development of liturgy that the priests more and more prayers are added to the liturgy for the priests to pray and to intercede for the pre people. These are both, these are audible prayers. These are silent prayers and these are secret prayers. And there were more and more and more and more added to the liturgies. You take a look at the Byzantine liturgy. No priest prays more for his people, more prays more his, for his flock than I, I think in the Byzantine rite. The priest there prays, he intercedes for our sins so deeply and so often and so profoundly, so long, that you can't walk away from that liturgy saying that the priest doesn't care about my salvation, the priest doesn't love me, the father doesn't love me. You, you never walk away from the Byzantine thinking that a priest doesn't want you to be saved, he doesn't want you to be holy, because he keeps praying for your sins over and over and over again. And I would say the same very... The, the the traditional the Roman rite the traditional Latin rite, lots of intercessory prayers by the priest there, long, profound, deep, impactful, 
And you can't walk away either, I think, from the Roman right, from the traditional Lance of Mass, rather, saying that the priest doesn't care about my salvation. But this is why the Norvis Ordo right is deficient. As sin increased in the world, the priests in the Mass prayed for us more profoundly and deeply until we got to the post-conciliar Mass of Second Vatican Council, right at the height of the sexual revolution. The church said, we want the priests to pray for the people less. As sin increased in the world, right there at the end of the 1960s, into the 70s, the church said, priests, pray less. That's deficient. And there's no way to get around that other than just completely reforming the Norvis Order right in, in, in a lot of ways. So, and so that's the struggle with the Norvis Ordo, that the priest doesn't pray well for the people. And he's supposed to be in persona Christi. He's supposed to be in a person of Christ. He's supposed to be an intercessor or a mediator. In a Norvis Ordo, he doesn't pray well for us. And it's sad. So that that's the struggle. Okay. But in that body that we have here of how do we make the Norvis Ordo? What do we how do we make it reverent? What what we find there is that there's two things that we're going to see tonight. We're going to see, we're going to, we're going to discover, I think what we discovered, one, is that there is a Vatican II Mass. I'm sorry. What we discovered is that there, there's a post-Vatican II Mass, conciliar Mass, what we call Norvis Ordo. We've seen those. Most of us, most Catholics go to those. Um, those eventually become a Mass nightmare. That's their trajectory. If you're in a parish that does a Norvis Ordo, celebrates worships a Norvis Ordo, right? Then... You're one priest away from a clown mass. Just one priest away. Just one priest away from complete obliteration. But what we're going to see today is there's an also, there's another mass that I think is the best that the post-Vatican II church has to offer. And it's not called a Norvis Ordo. I, just, I don't call it, I don't call it a Norvis Ordo. I call it a Vatican II mass. It's a Vatican II Mass, meaning that it's the Mass that Vatican II allowed. And let me explain that to you. So, here is the con sacred constitution, the constitution of sacred liturgy from Vatican II. Okay. And in this document of the church, if you never read it, it allows, it gives some sort of construct for a reform of the liturgy. And it says nothing about what the mass that we have today is not what this document allowed. Okay, so let me just give you a couple examples. In number four, okay. It says, lastly, in faithful obedience to tradition, the sacred council declares that the Holy Mother Church holds lawfully, holds all lawfully acknowledged rights to be of equal rights and dignity. That she wishes to preserve them in the future and to foster them in every way. The council also desires that where necessary, the rights may be right, the rights be revised carefully in light of sound tradition and that they be given new vigor to meet the circumstances and needs of modern times. So clearly one problem here is what's, what's going on now with Pope Francis is that the council said she wishes to preserve them, the older rights, and foster them in every way. The church is not fostering them now. Pope Francis is doing the opposite of foster, right? Also, the council also desires when necessary that rights be revised. Okay, so we can't say that the Novus Ordo, the post conciliar mass, is something revised from the Roman rites, the traditional Latin mass, because it's too different to be revised. So that's that's one thing I'd like to point out to you. The second thing is in number 14. It says the mother church earnestly desires that all the faithful be led to the 
to that fully conscious and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. So the church, what the church wanted to do, only thing Vatican, only thing Vatican to this, this document really called for is for there to be some sort of change in participation in the mass. It makes, it, it goes on and makes a lot of points about this participation. So we can, okay, so the new mass should be participatory. Okay, we can say that. In number 22, it says, regulation of sacred liturgy depends solely on authority of church, that is the apostolic see, and laws may be determined on the bishop. Okay. Number three in 22 says, therefore, no person, even he be a priest, may add, remove, or change anything in her liturgy according to his own authority. So when you see what's going on in these mass nightmares with these priests uh, doing strange things to liturgy, just adding and taking away by according to their own whim and desire, that is not, that's in violation of the magisterial teaching of the church. All right. So they're acting contrary to what the church teaches, perhaps even sinfully. This is what the church teaches. And then number 34 says the rights should be distinguished with noble simplicity. They should be short, clear, and unencumbered with useless repetitions. They should be within the people's power of comprehension and normally should not require much explanation. Okay. So the church was saying in Vatican II that it did want to return to a time 1,500 years ago when the liturgy was shorter, it was simple, it wasn't under, it was it didn't have a bunch of uh, uh, what they call useless repetition. So they did want a much shorter mass, something that people could comprehend without much explanation. They wanted a mass that was more accessible to all people. Okay. This document also keeps repeating the fact that it wanted um, Latin to be part of the church, particular law remaining in force. The use of Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. The church, the document also goes on to talk about how what part of the Mass could be in a vernacular, you know, it talks about the readings, the gospel readings in certain places like that. But the Mass was supposed to remain in Latin. In some places and circumstances, however, an even more radical ab adaptation of liturgy is needed and entails greater difficulties, wherefore. So there was a move in the Second Vatican Council to make, to open a door to what we call liturg um, liturgical enculturation. And we do see examples of this, but like the Cong Congolese Mass, um, where it's a particular mass that's particularly designed just for the local people. All right, so the church did make room for some types of liturgical enculturation. And then lastly, in 54, it says, in masses which are celebrated with the people, a suitable place may be allotted to their mother tongue. This is to apply in the first place the readings and the common prayer, but also as local conditions may warrant to those parts, which pertains to the people, according to the norm laid down in article 36 of this constitution. So again, let's go back to 36 and see where can we use English? All right. So, so again, it outlines here places where the Latin can be excluded again the readings and directives to some prayers and chants. Okay. So, so there you have it is really the difference between what happened, which is the Novus Ordo mass, the post conciliar mass versus the mass of Vatican II. So according to what the church teaches, what can a faithful demand? Like I said, one thing the faithful should demand, as the church taught about it, too, we should demand access to all the liturgical rites, right? Because the church said 
that it wanted to foster those rights. That's the teaching of the church, to foster the older rights. So we have a demand to access those. We have a right to access those. The second thing the church, the, the, weak demand, the, the weak, faithful demand, is the Vatican II Mass. A lot of Latin, <laughs> all right? And um, in reverence pertaining thereto, and also we should demand the Mass be celebrated at Orientum with the priests facing Calvary. This document says nothing about the Mass, the priest facing the people. So those are two things that we demand. And so I'm about to show you a Mass that is truly a Vatican II, truly a Vatican II Mass. So let me bring that in and let me get to your comments before we get into this portion of the show. And also, if you guys want to just hop into the show, if you have a comment, you know, I do get to your comments written, but if you have a comment that you want to say out loud, hop into the live stream, just click on that link that you see posted, um, stamped above. If you have your camera, or your mic working, yeah, just hop into the show. Let us know. Let us know what you think. Yeah. A lot of you guys, um, a lot of you had, have put this message out and I said, Hey, can you send me some masses where that are reverend? It uses a lot of Latin, no altar servers. And there's a communion rail. And I was surprised, like there, like were so many that you all sent me, like, um, and people were saying, "Oh, it's a unicorn." It doesn't seem to be a unicorn at all. There seems to be more reverence masses than there are true mass nightmares, you know, like the Saint Sabinas, you know, those type of things. A lot more. So, I was actually impressed, and a lot of you had picked out some of the usual suspects. You had picked out the one in Chicago, Saint John. Um, Kanchis, and a lot of you said Father Howman, you know, um, Ave Maria down in Florida, you know, the usual suspects, right? But there were some others that I never heard of. So, man, I was I was so impressed that people know where to find a Reverence Norvis Ordo. So, let me get to some more comments. Yeah, my man Gary, yep, yep, a lot of that a lot of father, yeah, Howman, Howman. Um, um, Laura B says, our Norvis Order is reverence and changing to be more traditional. We have young priest who's making corrections. Yeah, and Laura B, she sent me her mask, and we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that one in the future. Cause I think that's a good example. Um, the liturgy of the word is definitely one of the worst parts of Novus Ordo that is over overlooked. Yeah, and I think that goes back to the comment I was making earlier, Sneed, that during that portion is where you see the, all the older rites, the priest prays very well for us. He prays ardently, uh, ferociously even for us. In a Novus Ordo, he... he gosh, it's like he doesn't even... He's like he's not even our father. He doesn't even pray for us like he ought. Um, JC says, on Davis, honestly, since I discovered the traditional Latin Mass, I never went back to the North Soto for over two years now, and it's because of the lockdown. Yeah, I can see that. My buddy Brand is here. Uh, who else is here? A lot of people are here, man. If you guys haven't um, hit a like button, please hit the like button if you haven't already. A lot of comments, a lot of comments. David, I see the comparison, Norvis Ordo and TLM. Um, there's so many, there are so many was taken out. Yeah. Yeah, you're talking about, the, I guess JC is talking about all the prayers that the priest says. Yeah, so many were taken out. Um, Amarathoria says, excellent points, David. I had to study Vatican II for my college theology class, graduated from a Catholic university. Vatican II Mass is different from liturgical dancers. Yeah, I'm glad you yeah, I'm glad you appreciate and I'm glad you appreciate that point. A lot of people don't recognize that there is like a mass that the Vatican the Vatican II authorized. <laughs> we just never saw that mass. We just never saw the mass, the one that they authorized. Um I mean I think I'm sorry. We do see it. I'm about to show you example, and I think there are some examples out there. But it took us a while to get there. 
And I think the Norvis Oro, which they gave us with the versus Populum and all that stuff is, um, yeah. All right. So let's get into this anti-mass nightmare with the 25 minute mark. All right, so, and what church is this? Hold on one second. I forgot to list the parish that this one is at. So this is actually going to be a daily mass at this parish. So don't be depressed when you don't see a whole lot of people. I, I've seen their Sunday masses, um, standing room only. But this one here is a daily, a daily mass. So this is from St. Anne's Church in Gilbert, Arizona. So this is St. Anne in Gilbert, Arizona. Okay. And one thing you can see, I mean, just from, you know, one, one thing, one thing that a lot you complain about all the time is like, where's the sanctuary? Where's, where's the tabernacle? Where's Jesus? Where's the crucifix? Here, here's a church that does it right. You, you see the tabernacle, you see, clearly see Jesus. <laughs> Can't miss him. Okay. So just from the, oh, just from the, just from looking at it, this is not what you typically see from the Norvis Ordo Mass, okay? And just from that, just from that, just from that short brief opening procession, right? Um, sung in Latin, a chant. They just look like serious. It just looks like serious worship. It looks like worship is about to begin. Okay. Uh, the seriousness of it, the choreography with the altar server in the priest. I don't know the other gentleman. He may be a priest. He may be a deacon. I forget. Um, the kissing the altar, the reverence. You just immediately know that this is sacred space. And these, these priests, these ministers have not come to entertain you. <laughs> In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Gratia Domini nostri Iesu Christi et caritas Dei et communicatio Sancti Spiritus sit cum omnibus vobis. Cum Spiritu Tu. Fratres, agnoscamus peccata nostra ut aptissimus a sacra misteria celebranda. Confite ordeo omnipotenti, et vobis, fratres, cuia peccavi nimis cogitazione, verbo, opere et omissione. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. So just here at the opening rite, during the, um, the rite of penance, you see the priest is progressing through this in 
the um, in the in a Norvis Ordo form, uh, he's versus Populum. He's facing the people. And there's some others. There's another example I was going to show you where during the Confidiator, the priest does face the Calvary, does face Calvary. But here at St. Anne's, he is still versus Populum. He's facing the people. But he's he's uh, matriculating through the liturgy all in Latin so far. And the people are responding to Latin. This is a Vatican II Mass, right? Remember, the Vatican II um, doc sac document on sacred liturgy, uh, sacred con constitutional sacred liturgy, these are the places where they said still still use the Latin. It, it didn't say use English here at, at these parts. There are some options. Maybe you could do the Confiditor in English, but it really wanted as much Latin as possible. And here at St. Anne's, they're doing that. So let's... Idio precor beata Mariam semper virginem, omnis angelos et santos, et vos fratres, orare pro me, ad dominum Deum nostrum. Misereatur nostri omnipotens Deus, et dimisis pecatis nostris, perducat nos ad vitam eterna. Amen. Amen. Kyrie I guess you get you get the you know I guess you can see the point of that. We don't have to keep we don't have to stay there. That so far all we've heard is Latin from the opening from the procession chant to um, the um, confidiator to the um, Kyrie eleison. Um, and this is this is all you're going to hear until we get to the readings at Saint Anne's. And so, but he's still, you know, he's still versus Poplum. So, you know, he sits and then comes, you know, you do have the lector over here. You can see her, you can see her to, you can see her to, you can see her to the right. Um, and then the Psalms. You it is who hold fast my heart. Still in English. All right. And then the priest comes up, or he's a deacon, he comes up. Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Joannem. And even before he begins reading the gospel, he um, he does introductory proclamations in Latin as well. Then he reads it in English. Lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus prayed, saying, I pray not only for this, but also for those who will be. So a little bit different than obviously what you see in the traditional Latin Mass, where the first reading of the gospel is going to be in Latin. The priest may give what he'll call a, um, a what does he call it when he does the gospel in English? He'll see, Typically, he'll say this is the translation or something like that um but people tend to sit they'll be sitting down for the one in english whether they would have stand up for the one in latin so here he's reading the gospel in english right. and then and then watch this transition after the gospel reading. I want to make sure, did he, let me see if he did that in Latin, hold on. Right. 
righteous Father, the world also does not know you, but I know you, and they know that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Verbum Domini. So he even concludes the the you know the proclamation after the reading in 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 Latin as well, and then there's this transition between the two, which I thought I thought was really again the choreography. This is just like serious worship. This is a daily mass, a daily mass, and this is just serious worship. I mean, you just know that. This is just a sacred space. Something is different here than it is in the world. This place is unlike the world. And it's not like the guys here are like dressed in suits. You know, you can see, you know, people got on, you know, a polo shirt, maybe some jeans. You know, a guy over here could have put an iron on his shirt, you know. Um, you know, so you see quite a number of veils. But um, so people aren't dressed to the tees or anything like that. But still they know that this is serious worship just by how serious the priests conduct themselves. I mean, take a look. That the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now the priest goes on to give like just a really profound homily. If you have a chance, um, I would definitely go over to St. Anne's and look at this. This um, this mass from. the Thursday of June 2nd. So June 2nd, I, I would go listen to this homily. I'm not going to, I'm not going to play the whole thing here because it is rather long, <laughs> really long for a daily mass, <laughs> but um, it's serious. It's, it's really profound and really, really good. And that's, that's the other thing about, that's just, I think, even petronatural, just, just natural to the liturgy itself. When the priest conducts himself seriously, you know what follows? The homily is serious. It's serious matter. It's not a stand-up comedy routine. It's, it's not some sort of cute um, um, story about, you know, some sort of... Um, story out of some book or something like that. There's a made up situation that the priest would then create some sort of homily after. No, I think the more serious a liturgy is, the more serious the homily is. I think one facilitates the other. And, and so, yeah, so he gave a really, a really good, a really good homily. And let's see if I could play a piece of he's still going. Work of the Holy Spirit in us happens before our eyes at every holy mass. The priest during the epiclesis invokes the gift of the Holy Spirit so that by his power the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of the Lord. It is then that Christ becomes present on the altar in the act of offering himself to the Father for our salvation. Along these lines, today I would like to speak about the importance and the meaning of the altar 
in the Eucharistic celebration. I mean, this, this, this priest is just killing it. <laughs> I mean, we're here at a daily mass and he just starts off just going in on the whole Eucharist. Like, and now he's about to do a whole sermon. I'm not even going to call it a homily. He's about to give a whole sermon at a daily mass on the, at the daily mass on the altar, the sacrifice on the altar at a daily mass. I mean, he, he it's it's the prayers are going to be deficient compared to the other liturgies and the older ones. He's not going to pray well for the people, but he's doing the best as he, at his, as he can with just serious, serious worship. So the homily began at about the 19 minute mark in the mass. And it ended at about the 30 minute mark. So yeah, a 10 minute homily during a weekday. All right. And notice how the people knew that it was time to stand, right? I hate when the priest has to go like this. You know, you should already know. Whenever the priest stands, you stand. When the priest sits, you sit. And the people here at this daily mass, they get it. And they're they're doing well if they just had paid attention to the altar server, right? You know, do whatever the deacon does, you know, do whatever the altar server does. But that's beautiful how they not only does the priest know how to offer worship, they know how to worship. Everybody's here like they're like all adults here. They're all um, mature in, in their in their worship worship. Inoc Pascali Gaudio, fratres carissimi, Deum instantium exoremus, ut qui preces supplicationesque dilecti fili sui propitius exaudibit, humilitatem quoque nostram dignetur aspicere. So he's calling for the universal prayers and now. For the church, that by our faith we break down barriers between different classes of people, let us pray to the Lord. And Vatican II said this is a place where we can use English, you know, the, the universal prayers. So they, they're they using very minimal, very minimal English, right? And now it's time for the, the prayers of consecration. <laughs> Or 
Frate, frate, sut meum ac vestrum sacrificium acceptabile fiat apud Deum Patrem omnipotente. Suscipiat Dominus sacrificium de manibus tuis, ad laudem et gloriam nomini sui, ad utilitatem coque nostram, tofiusque ecclesie sue sancte. Suscipe sancte pater munera que in sanctorum martyrum commemorazione de ferimus, et nobis famulis tuis concede, ut in confessione tui nominis, in veniri stabiles mereamur. Per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Dominus vobiscum. Sursum corda. Grazia. And you see there, now, now the priest is like um, pretty much just all at Orientum now during the prayers of consecration, now during the liturgy of the Holy Eucharist. He's like 100% at Orientum. He's facing Calvary. He has Calvary right in front of him, front of him with a huge crucifix. Um, the people are still doing what Vatican II called for, some sort of active participation so in their responding to him as he he calls them to pray um here he's doing the source of coda lift up your hearts we lift them up to you, the lord and so um that's and you get the the gist of that the whole all the eucharistic prayers are completely in latin um here are the prayers of consecration he he everyone's kneeling very solemnly There is the elevation. You see the elevation here, um, still at Orientum. He's interceding for a people in the direction of our source of revelation, which is Calvary. He's leading us in prayer. He's showing us how to pray as, as a father of the household teaches his children to pray. He's praying to the father and we're praying with him. So that's, um, so that's that when I bring another one in real quick, because you didn't see communion at that one but here is another that i thought was very solemn this is saint francis of assisi i forget what city but they're very solemn here um now he does actually leave with um he's, he's going to do the prayers of consecration also in latin i mean i'm sorry at orientum but most of the mass he's going to do in english so it's, this is going to be a pretty much english speaking at ori uh, it's going to be at orientum so it's it's closer to a vatican II mass But it's very solemn. Uh, of course, you know, some people are going to be, you know, disappointed that an altar girl is up there. Um, you know, Vatican II didn't say anything about, about the that. history of faith. RSVP. I mean, here they don't have. An extended altar rail. You can see they cut some of their altar rail short. But as you see people come up, you see the vast majority of people are going to receive on the tongue, or they're going to receive kneeling and on a tongue. So again, everyone here is just dead serious about about worship. Um, and here is another. Again, you can see just the setup of the altar. 
Uh, you see the tabernacle. You don't see a large crucifix. You see risen Jesus um, up at the top. And then you see a small crucifix down at the bottom. Gird your loins and light your lamps. And be like servants. Their foes. For me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us. So then this is another, this is another mass. And it's going to be an ad orientum. But it's going to be primary, primarily in English. Uh, it's going to be versus populum until he gets to the, the prayers of consecration again. And then it's going to be ad orientum. God, for we know it. And the prayers are going to be in, in English. Okay. But again, just, just the reverence is very close to a, um, a Vatican II mass. And you can see everyone's coming up. Christ our Lord. Amen. Just want to say, uh, give us, but only. Let me get to the communion, right? At the communion, right? Everyone is coming up for the most part. Everyone is coming up to the altar rail. Uh, the vast majority of people, of course, they're receiving on the tongue. So, um, pretty close, pretty close to a, um, legitimate, um, Vatican II mass. Okay. So I, th so I think this is, I think this is where this, I think this would be the standard. I think if we're going to say, okay, is, is the mass reverent or not? Is it, is it a Vatican II mass or not? And I think the only reverent Vatican II mass, the only way to have a reverent mass that's not one of the older liturgies is a true Vatican II mass. You're just not going to, I don't think, really get it with the Norvis Ordo. I just don't think you can get it there. So the only way it would be a Vatican II mass that's primarily said in Latin, that's ad orientum. So... So I think this really gives us some construct to really what to ask our priest for, what to ask our bishop for. If we have to have the Norvis Ordo, if Pope Francis just wants this to be the mass of the church, then what we should ask for is the Vatican II mass. A lot of, most of it in Latin ad orientum. And um, I think this will do a better job in, in promoting people's holiness. And I think that's evident because you see here that people are serious the priest is serious and people are serious about worship. People who are serious about their worship have more likelihood of becoming saints. They have more likelihood of having less sin in their life. Um, you know, still have struggles, still have issues. Holiness doesn't fix problems. You know, we still suffer in some sense. In fact, we may have more suffering, <laughs> but um, it puts us on a better path. Serious worship, serious Catholic worship puts us on a, uh, a more sure path, a more sturdy path to pursuing holiness through the sacraments because the sacraments are taken serious. So that's my thoughts on it. So sh shorter show today because we don't have a whole lot to laugh at. <laughs> you know, we have a whole, a whole nightmare to get frustrated with. I don't come close to like dropping some curse words on YouTube for everyone to hear. Cause I know some of you are watching with your children and I do, I do my best not to curse, but I'm always just this close. Just know that just in case you do have your kids watching one day and I just, I just drop it. I just drop it like it's hot. Um, but if I haven't so far, if I haven't, if I haven't done it with St. Sabina, I haven't done it with the guitar mass or the Skittle mass, I probably won't. Nothing made me more angry than a Skittle mass. Those Skittles who are, who are, partners coming up and giving a homily so if i didn't yeah if i didn't drop the f-bomb then i probably won't but what do you think let me get some of your comments and like i said if one of you want to and if you want to just hop on just click the button in the description box and uh that's pinned up there and hop on to the show let me see <laughs> that kelly say no red gym bags there <laughs> yeah Father Redback at St. Dominic's in um, Saginaw, Michigan. 
<laughs> What's his name? Steve. Father Redbag Steve. Yeah, celebrating the Mass. Not having celebration or entertainment at the Mass. Yeah, imagine that. Yeah, no entertainment. And nobody wants to be entertained. Right? And I sort of balk at that a little bit. Because I don't know. I don't know if it's just me. But it's probably not. I'm sure it's not just me. But ritual, ritual entertains me. The bells, the smells, the choreography, um, Cardinal Burke coming in with just a long train, like he like he's somebody's bride, thus, walking in with a train. Um, there, there's really nothing more that that entertains me. It makes me happy. And I'm entertained by it, but in in a holy type of way, right? I'm just happy to see. I'm just happy to see reverence. I love that stuff. Christine said, um, "Headed to daily mass now in L.A., where 95 percent of the priests wear masks. Social justice prayer attentions. But I'm here for the Eucharist. Yeah, God bless you, Christine. Hang in there. Hang in there." Hang in there. Brandon says, I just don't understand why the ridiculous masses that are taking place. Why would you not want reverence and serious? Why do we need conform to the world? Yeah, that's that's the exact point. Why, why when I come to the mass, it feels like I'm out in the world. Why can't the mass be different than the world? Because we're being called to be unlike the world, but still in the world. So why can't the mass call us to that place? that we're supposed to aspire to rather than the place that we're just in the pilgrimage in. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like why change tradition? Yeah. These masters are not having me running out heading <laughs> to confession. <laughs> right. Because the priests don't care about God. So sarcasm yeah, is dead. Yep. Yeah. And let me show you this one, this, um, I don't know if you ever seen in um, the Ambrosian rite, but this is as far as like the masses of the West go. I find the Ambrosian to be one of the the most beautiful. Now, what I'm about to show you this the the Ambrosian. Right, is um, the most beautiful thing about it, I think, is that during the entrance procession is where they're going to sing the the Kyrie eleison, right? And they're going to stop in the middle of the nave, in the middle of the procession, and they're going to sing the Kyrie eleison. 12 times and I, I i just find that just so beautiful so here they're in the procession you see all the smoke you see the bishop stop
there's just nothing i just i just don't find anything just more beautiful than that as far as masses that are that come out of the come out of the west um so the ambrosian right named after of course saint ambrose um, who was from Milan, you know, they, this is another name for the Ambrosian, right? Is the mass of Milan. It was a local mass, um, Milan, um, Italy. Um, you know, it was also called the Melanese, right? So, but you know, everyone knows you say Am Ambrosian, right? From St. Ambrose. I mean, what's more beautiful than that? I mean, just stopping in the middle of the procession, entrance procession, stopping in the middle of the nave, all the smoke, all the solemnity, all the seriousness, just stop in the middle of the nave and sing the Kyrie eleison 12 times, right? And 12 isn't even enough, right? Ever seen the Kyrie eleison? I mean, you could, you could sing that in, until, you know, you can see that 12 hours straight. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. I mean, um, you just can't stop. And they, they sing it. No, no one sings it more than what happens in Ambrosian, right? And they do it right in the beginning. And again, that's just serious worship, just serious worship. And that's what, that's the type of stuff we're just missing out on in, in the Novus Ordo that, um, we just deserve better than what we are given with that post conciliar mass. But I think we can try to recapture just some of the seriousness and some of the surety that liturgy, that liturgy puts us on to sainthood by asking for, just give us the Vatican II mass. Just give us the Vatican II mass. That's all we want. All right, let's head out of here soon. Let me, um, Get your comments before we go. <laughs> Thank you, Dad, for cleansing our minds tonight. Yeah. Hope I stirred in you. Just like what I wanted to do is just like give you like some little bit of hope, a little bit of encouragement. Step away from the mass nightmares just for a moment and show you what it and show you what is possible. And because I think we could get there. Um and I definitely think we should get there. Yeah, refreshing stream tonight. I appreciate you guys saying that. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, I'd like to find these churches financially support them. Yeah. <laughs> no murder stories. <laughs> you guys remember, like, you have a really great memory of these mass nightmares. <laughs> yeah, no bubbles. <laughs> Uh, JC, I go to mass of worship and immense in the love of God and to ask for the grace to be faithful to him. Yeah. Um, Jeremiah said that long Cape David is called a Kappa Magna. So a great Cape. Okay. Yeah. Great Cape. So yeah, that makes sense. I, was, I called it a train because it looks like a wedding dress to me, but that's fine. But yeah, I, I'll take great Cape. Sounds like great, great ape, but yeah, I love smoke too. I love smoke too. I'm glad I don't have asthma or something like that, but yeah, <laughs> look how beautiful the incense. Yeah. Red says I'd be sneezing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't believe what I've been missing. If only people could experience this as heavenly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Ambrosian, I've never, I've never seen one in person, right? I watch them, you know, when I can on YouTube. I wrote about it in my book, Divine Symphony. I have like a little section on Ambrosian, right? But definitely, next time, you know, when I'm in Europe for the next five years, I'm definitely going to try to get to, I'm going to try to make it maybe one a year. Just so beautiful. The Latin mass changed everything for me. Then I finally understood what the mass was supposed to be. Yeah. I feel bad for people whose first experience was just like a beautiful Latin mass. Um, I mean, where do you go from there? Right. Like the first time I went to a Byzantine mass, 
it was like, I couldn't believe I was in Warren, Ohio anymore. I went to this church called St. Peter and Paul in Warren, Ohio. I, I was in there. I'm like, am I still in Warren, Ohio? <laughs> it was just like out of this world. And then I really never experienced anything like that since. It's, it's, everything's been disappointing thereafter. It's sad. What if Vatican II was an invention to advance the New World Order so that the original papers were simply a trick to usher in entry rays for the New World Order and now the who? Yeah, I definitely believe that people used Vatican II to, um, man, it just came at a bad time. I wish there was never a council. I wish there was never a Vatican II. It just came at the wrong, wrong time. Imagine, but imagine if there was a Vatican III today. With Supich and Gregory and Tobin and Baron, <laughs> and uh, imagine a council being imagine Vatican II being held today, or Vatican III being held today with these characters, with Pope Francis presiding over a council. Heinrich coming out of Luxembourg. Imagine how gay Vatican III would be. It'd be like, it'd be like a Skittle convention. It'd be like a, a Skittles convention. It'd be like, yeah, we just call it the Skittle Council. <laughs> Skittle Council. Skittle Council number one. <laughs> That's what it would be. So if the church is going to have a council, I guess we're, we're glad it was, I'm glad it was during a sexual revolution, right? Uh, did because it was bad, but man, imagine imagine how bad it could have been if they waited until now to have the Skittle Council. Woo, woo wee, <laughs> man. Oh, I know we trust the Holy Spirit, but um, man, that's a lot of devils in one place. <laughs> And I hate to say that, I hate to say, but after we trust the Holy Spirit, like I know we trust the Holy Spirit, but, but seriously, I mean, that's a lot of devils in one place. Wow. Oh, thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. Yeah. Share, share, share. That's because we were traumatized by some mess. <laughs> I never learned any from the nervous order. I learned a lot from you there. I appreciate that, JC. Uh, I think times of the council is over. Yeah, I mean, who needs a council when you have a senate? All right, when you have a senate on the senate, who needs a council? You can like inc you could work in all all these little changes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It, you should never say butt and Skittles. And say, Ooh, very good, Jeremiah. That was a good catch. <laughs> that was a good catch. All right. I'm out of here. Uh, I'll see you guys on Friday. Got an interview. But if anything else comes up that we need to talk about, I'll make sure to hop back in and um, give some thoughts and comments. Um, without a filter and without a teleprompter. <laughs> but good night. Love you guys. Thanks for being my friends. Thank you for being my friends. Down the road and back again. <laughs> Is that how the song goes? Peace. I like to ask you to I like hop to ask over to, to David L. Hop L. Over to David L. L. Become a sponsor there if you like. Join my mailing list if you like. And Visit The Gray Report while you're there for the latest news from a rigid Catholic link.